Well, thank you so much to Mantan for organizing uh, this sort of an event. Now, uh, what is going on in the next three days or next four days here in Hyderabad is uh, an event called the International Congress on Infectious Diseases. It's being held at uh, uh, the HICC. And uh, in fact, this is the largest general purpose infectious disease conference in the world. And it is coming to India for the very first time and certainly to Hyderabad. In fact, it's coming to the uh, subcontinent itself for the very first time. Uh, and so many of uh, you know, our friends and colleagues have come for this meeting, uh, including the experts who are right here. Of course, Radha lives right here in Hyderabad itself. Um, but uh, it's, it's a great opportunity also for us to be able to discuss an issue that we talk about in technical terms, the next four days we'll thrash it in terms of data and all of that stuff, but also to have the opportunity to engage in a conversation on why this issue of access to effective antibiotics is such a critical one for each of us as citizens, as people who are patients ourselves, potential patients, uh, certainly people whose uh, parents or grandparents will, uh, you know, will inevitably have to go through a situation where they may have a bacterial infection that is not treatable. Um, and, uh, you know, just to start by saying that for us in India, this is a very serious problem. But before I offer a full introduction on this, if I could just ask my uh, my co-panelists to just introduce themselves, uh, if we can start with uh, with Alison. Good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Alison Holmes. Um, I'm a professor of infectious diseases from Imperial College London, and it's a real uh, privilege and a pleasure to be here. It's not a pleasure to take um, over Dilip Naswani's very, very important and big shoes with five minutes notice, but it's a real pleasure to be here and with you this evening. So thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Radha Rangarajan. Um, I have a biotech company here in Hyderabad. We work on next generation antibiotics. As, as the evening progresses, you'll see, uh, you know, w what the importance uh, of this kind of work is. But um, um, uh, just to say that I'm really happy to join the conversation this evening. Uh, my name is Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan and uh, I'm a professor at the Public Health Foundation of India and I direct the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy in Washington, D.C. I'm Dr. Sanjeev Singh. <coughs> I am a pediatrician by training and I've worked at World Health Organization for a couple of years before got vindicated by Amma's Mata Amrita Nanmai's love and move to Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences and I'm a medical superintendent there. Okay, so just by way of introduction, I think, you know, first we'll, uh, you know, we'll go through uh, a at least a, uh, a discussion of what antimicrobial resistance is. Now, each of my co-panelists have, you know, maybe a couple of slides to show, but we'll try to keep it very brief and really try to get into a conversation about concerns that each of you may have and how we can address these. Uh, just by way of context, uh, what Allison does is run, uh, you know, basically antimicrobial programs, infection control for, you know, the very large systems, but also for the National Health Service in the UK, uh, which is faced with this problem in a, in a very major way. And I think there's a lot for us to learn from how the UK is doing things and, of course, from what they're not doing as well. Uh, you know, Sanjeev does the same uh, function here on our side with respect to uh, Amrita Hospital. And, and rather as represents, you know, the whole biotech side of, of AMR, which is, although we have depended on the West for many years for new antibiotics, that may hopefully now be shifting that we have, you know, homegrown companies that are going to be the ones that come up with the next new set of antibiotics. So uh, just, just as a brief introduction, rather do you want to play that slide or? So if we'll just play a very short video, just to, you know, set the context, because sometimes people are, uh, confused about whether it is our resistance to antibiotics, whether it's the antibiotics resistance to the bacteria, whatever it is. So at least you, we, we start on the same place with respect to the biology of what we're talking about, and then we can start off. Can everyone see this? It's possible to me later. I told you. Okay, 
So that gives you a sense. It's basically a problem associated with natural selection. We are killing off the bacteria that are sensitive, leaving only the ones that are resistant. And therefore, when we are treating, treating, uh, try to treat these infections, our antibiotics don't work anymore. Now, if you, I, we won't be presenting any slides on how bad this is, but if you look at just the, uh, you know, the flyer, uh, and it has a map, and you just have to see the, the color around India, and this is, uh, I think, a picture of, uh, you know, carbapenem resistant uh, or cephalosporin resistance, third generation cephalosporin resistance in E. coli. E. coli is a good target uh, species. And third generation cephalosporin resistance is a serious problem. We also have carbapenem resistance, uh, which shows that we are really the epicenter of this for a number of reasons. One is we have lots of antibiotics. As any of us know here, you can go and buy one across uh, at any pharmacy that you want without a prescription. Uh, some of the good news is that people are able to afford new antibiotics, which is a good thing. But it also means that there's a lot of overuse of antibiotics. And third, we have a huge background rate of infectious disease, which is not the case in many other countries. I mean, certainly not in the UK. We have, you know, still a lot of diarrhea, still a lot of respiratory infections. So we are trying to attack these infections using antibiotics. That is not the right strategy. We have to deal with it with vaccination, public health, and so forth. So with that, if I could turn first to my colleague, Dr. Sanjeev Singh, and have him talk a few minutes about what it is that a patient might expect to encounter in the form of hospital infections, infections that you get in a hospital. You didn't go there with a the hospital. And what the current situation is with respect to the chance that it might be an untreatable infection. So any patient who comes to the hospital, uh, if he is going to stay the uh, in a primary and secondary care center, it's still easier. If you get to a tertiary care center, it's going to be very, very challenging. Beyond three days of stay, it's you are predisposed to get infected. And if the lines and tubes are there in place, which are devices, your chances of infection triples <coughs> with each day of uh, being hospitalized. Because as soon as the devices are put in, the organisms which are possibly a commensal or the organism which comes in while, inter while you introduce the device creates a film around it and then there is the, there the chance of uh, device related infection increases. In my uh, uh, kind of service in pediatric and neonate almost 100% are susceptible now to get an infection because they are premature, they are low birth weight, they are intrauterine growth retarded uh, kids malnourished so as and our practices in the hospital as it is said that it even if you are a, uh, staying at a slum dweller it is much easier and much safer to get treated at home rather than in a hospital because unfortunately all kind of multi drug or pan drug resistant organisms exist uh, within the hospital setting so more you stay more devices you get in more you get treated with costly antibiotic more are the chances for infections and these are pretty high. In public sector settings, their chances are close to 33 percentage. In a good private setup where the surveillance is going on, the chances is close to 6 to 10 percent of you, of you landed up into a healthcare associated infection. So just to add to that point, what proportion, what is the chance or the, what is the case fatality, the chance that a neonate, a newborn with sepsis might die if they had a drug resistant infection? Chance is 100 <coughs> percent because there is nothing which is left uh, beyond that and most of the deaths which happens uh, within the hospital setting ultimately 30, 33 percent have septicemia component with it. So and that is the disaster part of it and that is why we are all having this meeting that is why we are discussing it because until unless if we are not pulling up our socks and the transplant program and oncology program is going to collapse in another three to four years there will be no transplant program in the country if you are not pulling up our socks there will be no surgical program in next 10 to 15 years within the within Indian setting and if we are still very laid back there will be no hospitals <coughs> uh, in another 20 to 30 years so it is so bad and I'm so glad to hear that there are newer drugs getting uh, made or invented or innovated within India. But as it is 
the situation is extremely, extremely bad. 100% of the patients in neonatal setting would uh, succumb to an infection. So India is in particularly great risk because we also have the greatest numbers of neonatal sepsis in the world, the number of newborns that have sepsis. And so our estimate is something like 60,000 newborns die every year because the antibiotics don't work for them. Because as uh, SNG was saying, you know, it, it, if it doesn't work, uh, the, the newborn doesn't get a second chance. Most of us will get a second chance because we have uh, more robust immunity. But if I can turn to uh, Professor Allison Holmes, to take forward this point on the need for antibiotics for effective surgeries and transplants. So of everyone here, how many of you ha know someone who has had a knee or a hip replacement? I'm surprised it's only this many. I would have thought everybody would know someone with a knee or a hip replacement. Um, but we have to remember that all of those procedures require antibiotics. So Alison, can you tell us about that and what drug resistance is doing there? So the issue about um, drug resistance and um, joint replacements, replacements is particularly important because it is absolutely disastrous, one, if you get an infection in a joint because no amount of antibiotic will take care of it, the joint will have to be removed um, and then you need to be on long periods of antibiotics. But if you have on top of that a resistant infection, it is doubly, doubly worse. And, and and we absolutely depend on antibiotics and the antibiotic prophylaxis, the prevention that antibiotics can give for us to carry out this type of surgery. So in the UK, our, um, our incidence of, of healthcare associated infection, so that's infection that you get when you're, you are in healthcare, you didn't come in with it, you, ca you came in for something else and you got an infection whilst you're in, in hospital, is around um, one in 10. Um, and the issue about us working on how we can improve prescribing is definitely a societal issue. It's for all of us to be thinking about because we need them for us, our children, our parents. But we also need to remember an important part of society that we need to communicate and with, and that is also all the prescribers. So when one works in hospitals, and I'm sure it's the same for you, Sanjeev, we are having to work very, very carefully with all the people that prescribe in our hospitals. So it's absolutely critical that they understand the message about how to use antibiotics um, correctly. Because although we desperately need new antibiotics, and it's really exciting that there's some um, fresh opportunities here, it will be no good if we can't preserve them and use them sparingly within our hospitals. So it's going to be important that we do both at the same time. Thanks, Alison. So to, to take that point further, one, one of the interesting things is that in the UK, drug-resistant infections are a political issue. They were actually part of the elections when, uh, when I remember Gordon Brown got elected. How did that happen? And here, I, I, you know, I'm sure uh, I'm willing to take a safe bet that our politicians have not really heard of antimicrobial resistance. How did you make that? So, so there's a backstory to this. Of course, an uh, MP had a mother that um, got an MRSA infection and decided that it was about time that um, there was a particular focus on antibiotic resistance. And, and in a way, it made life very difficult if you're working in hospitals, but actually it provided the external reinforcement for change when it became a political target and it became used as a kind of political football between our different political parties. So every time an election came up, this came up as a, a significant issue. So it was a, good, it was a good time to push change and challenge behaviors in hospital about antibiotic prescribing. But it didn't go far enough, Ramanam, because I think that's the problem. Because a lot of it was around um, infection control, which is absolutely critical. But it's no good doing infection control if you're not looking at your antibiotics at the same time. And that is why part of any infection control program must have at its heart antibiotic stewardship as well. Great. Depressing, but, <laughs> but great. But changes were made. Actually, if some of you had that CDEP, the State of the World's Antibiotics Report, if you look at, uh, some of you I saw had copies. If you look at MRSA rates in the U UK, for instance, they actually started coming down. They're coming down for the last seven years. In fact, the only country, large-scale country, for which data are present, for which resistance is going up, is India. So uh, in many ways, we are sort of the epicenter of this, uh, you know, for the rest of the uh, world. But 
primarily for ourselves. I mean, this is really a challenge for ourselves. So, which also brings us to solutions. Now, historically, antibiotics, and first of all, we've not had antibiotics that long. We've only had antibiotics, the, the current ones, which are made from you know, natural products, starting with penicillin, which was introduced in 1942. So literally, you know, just over 70 years, 74 years, it's not that long. And we have gone through about 16 classes of antibiotics. And the pipeline seems to have gotten a lot slower because at the end of the day, antibiotics are naturally derived compounds. You know, they are, you know, from nature in some way, shape or form, except for, except for the, you know, a couple of them. And it is getting much more expensive and difficult to find the next few ones, which is why it's great that at least two companies that I'm aware of in India are doing this. So rather, if I can turn to you and maybe tell us a little bit about what our prospects are both at, not just at Vitus, but, you know, what is the challenge in finding a new antibiotic? Why is it so difficult? Right. Thanks, Ramanan. Um, so a little bit of history to the discovery of antibiotics. You know, Alexander Fleming brought penicillin, uh, and then, you know, there were a series of discoveries of new antibiotics that came na mostly from natural sources. And essentially, it's bacteria fighting off other bacteria using products which we call anti antibiotics. Uh, and we deployed those same uh, products to fight infections. Um, so it's not so surprising that we now have resistance because clearly the bacteria that make them are resistant to them to those antibiotics in the first place. So there are naturally occurring resistance mechanisms which can then circulate and then they establish themselves. Now what's happened is that um, there was a period in the heyday of, the, uh, of, of uh, you know, antibiotic discovery we had, uh, you know, class upon class of antibiotics being discovered. But sometime around the 90s, uh, Big Pharma decided that there were enough antibiotics to go around and save humanity and that one really didn't need to put any more effort into new antibiotics. Uh, at that time, uh, for a variety of reasons, it seemed rational people moved into cancer, inflammation, and all kinds of other lifestyle diseases, which were thought to be more commercially attractive. But as a result of that, in the last 20 years, uh, in the last 25 years with no new antibiotics discovered what we have in our hands is a very serious unmet need which is that there are extremely drug resistant infections and world over globally the pipeline for new antibiotics is very sparse so what do i mean by that there are 41 antibiotics in the pipeline in various stages of development this is nothing compared to if you look at cancer hundreds of compounds in anti in, in development now of these 41 perhaps four uh, represent really breakthrough therapies. Uh, the rest are all reformulations of existing uh, classes of antibiotics. They're not going to be able to overcome resistance that is already here. So this is an important distinction for you to take away from this, which is that if you're taking a penicillin and you have a, you know, just a slightly better penicillin, uh, it's not going to be enough to fight off resistance. What you need is actually completely something else which the bacteria have never seen before. And those kinds of compounds are extremely hard to find. Uh, in the past, people relied on natural drug discovery. That is, they looked at marine animals, they looked at plants, they looked to bacteria, fungi, all kinds of uh, microorganisms to, look, to find uh, the next uh, natural product antibiotic. But that's very hit and miss. And it's extremely difficult to find those kinds of uh, antibiotics uh, you know, and no one has really succeeded lately. So what we do is actually look to synthesize uh, completely new chemicals which are antibacterial in nature. So uh, the, you know, the correct terminology for such compounds would be antibacterials. They're no longer from natural products. And uh, these antibacterials, uh, you know, they have a certain development cycle which I can talk about in a, you know, uh, in a little bit. But they are not easy to make and they take a lot of money to get to the market. So thanks. So just to remind you of how difficult this is, if you really just want to find something that kills bacteria, that per se is not that hard because alcohol will kill bacteria or, uh, you know, lots of lysing agents will kill bacteria. But the idea that you can then consume it, that it goes through your bloodstream, doesn't destroy you in any way because it is targeting a, targeting a living organism inside our body and attacking that without attacking the rest of us, which is also a living organism and requires that to be safe. But that's a very, very unique sort of a product that does that. So uh, I think we have to 
consider ourselves quite lucky to have had antibiotics in the first place. I mean, the idea that this could even happen seems like a, an amazing thing. So um, maybe we can open to the audience to ask specific questions. But you know, I'd like to focus perhaps on this idea of of how you perceive antibiotics. I mean. Uh, you know, have you taken antibiotics? Have you gone to a doctor and, uh, you know, asked for antibiotics? I'm first going to ask Sanjeev to just, you know, he had some statistics to present on the way over on just a survey that was recently done on how many doctors feel like they have to give an antibiotic to satisfy patients. But I want to know if that resonates with your experience and how you might see your role in, in preserving the power of antibiotics. Sanjeev, do you want to talk about that for a second? <clears throat> So we had been working with the government of Kerala to get a um, antibiotic policy released uh, just to have some kind of a uniformity in practice both in public sector and private sector. But before that uh, we wanted to understand whether there is a need or we just have an assumption that there it doesn't work and we need to have standardized practices. So we went uh, <coughs> ahead and asking questions to the doctors, to the microbiologist and to the pharmacist. And we also had an organism profile from uh, select uh, hospital to understand that there is a drug resistance which is happening. The results were very surprising. Uh, close to 89 to 90 percent of the doctors are prescribing antibiotics on daily basis, which is almost like prescribing a vitamin B capsule or vitamin C as an added additive uh, to a prescription. Uh, when we had asked them that there are newer antibiotics which are available, how do you know the mechanism of action? 73% of them said that they asked their colleagues regarding the mechanism, mechanism of action, but they still prescribe the newer antibiotics. When it was asked whether uh, do they actually think that uh, are patients asking for antibiotic, it is patient driven prescription. 44% of them are saying that patients have asked for antibiotics and that is why they are forced to write that as in the, in the prescription. Uh, this is, one thing is good that it is honest uh, opinion which has come from them, but another variety is it's, it's disastrous because uh, the way the prescription pattern and quality prescribing as Alison keeps saying, it is uh, really very bad. Similarly, uh, Close to 43% of the labs are not manned by microbiologists, trained microbiologists. So there is a report which goes out from the lab, but it is left to a doctor to understand it, and then he prescribes whatever he wants to prescribe. And 78% of the pharmacists have no clue about what are antibiotics and how they need to treat this antibiotic, despite the fact that there is a gadget publication. So they, over the counter, if you go, if you ask, that if I have a loose motion, he will give you something. He doesn't know whether it has an impact on loose motions or antibacterials have to be given. So overall, the survey is uh, very, very enlightening, but it also shows that uh, our uh, behavioral pattern uh, has to be changed. Otherwise, we are in a very deep soup. Right. So. You know, this is critical because the only countries that have done very well on this, like France for instance, it is because there was public awareness and public awareness which then led to people asking doctors, do I really need this antibiotic? So has any one of you ever asked the doctor, do I really need an antibiotic? First of you, how many of you have ever taken an antibiotic in your life? Okay, I should have asked the opposite question. Anyone's not taken an antibiotic in their life. See, this is very different, right? So every one of us needs antibiotics. How many of you have taken, you know, cancer chemotherapy? Probably very few. How many of you are on statins? Probably very few. How many of you are on hypertension drugs? Um, you know, very few. But antibiotics are something that all of us take. We have a certain amount of familiarity with them, which is a little dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, you know, my mother thinks, you know, since she was married to a doctor, she's half a doctor. So, you know, she would always say, yeah, yeah, yeah you can have the antibiotic. And I remember, you know, uh, obviously you do it because it's your mother, but uh, I'm sure there's lots of mothers out there who are just handing out antibiotics in sort of the same carefree way. But the question is what it is that will change that behavior and that knowledge. So, for instance, how many of you think that if you have a case of diarrhea that you need antibiotics. 
Okay. Don't be shy. No one's going to take a poll here or anything. How many of you think you need it if you have a respiratory infection, a upper respiratory infection? Okay. And how many of you think you might need one if you, uh, you know, if you had, say, a urinary tract infection? I guess that'd be the one. Okay. So I'm going to turn to uh, the actual clinician here and give us some feedback on when it's actually needed. So I think. I think um, what, what Ramanan has just shown beautifully is that we all use them, we all abuse them, and we're using them too much, frequently when they're not needed. So I also confessed to the complete abuse of them. So I, I confess to you all, but I'm not doing it anymore. Um, no, so, so I think a couple of important points about the, um, the scenarios that Ramanan was pointing out. So upper restrict upper respiratory tract infections, coughs and colds, they're normally caused by viruses, so our antibiotics or antibacterials will not work against them. Similarly, um, um, sometimes, uh, so, so similarly with diarrhea, often antibiotics completely inappropriate. And interestingly, also for urinary tract inf infections and symptoms of, uh, of, of urinary infections, but you do, you do need to make sure um, that you do get seen if there's a problem. But actually, you can often do with anti without antibiotics for those as well. But we have to be really, really careful that we make sure that whilst we're talking about how important it is we don't abuse antibiotics, that we don't abuse them as patients, we don't abuse them also as prescribers because they make us feel a little bit safer when we're looking after patients that we'll just give them more and more antibiotics. But we also have to make sure that we don't, we don't halt giving them to when it's needed and that we give them fast to the people when they need them fast. So we have to have this balancing act of making sure that we preserve them and we protect them. So we need to talk about antibiotic protection. Um, but we have to make sure that when people need them, they get them. But we must, must protect them. Otherwise, there won't be any to give. Even our new ones will, will not be effective if we don't protect them. Thank you. So, any questions now? So I, I can walk around, or maybe yeah. you can. Uh, Sarah is going to. Okay, okay, great. Ramnan, I'll I'll start yeah, with, yeah, please. with a question. I don't think all of us have really understood how uh, the resistance to antibiotics is built up. You need to amplify it. Okay, um, some of us know it, but not all of us know it. And I think it's very important that you. Tell us in lay terms how antibiotics resistance builds up in the environment, in, in the public, and what it eventually leads to. It might mean some repetition for you, but it's worth doing it. Also, many of yes. us are not aware of the difference between bacteria and viruses. Yes. Okay. And, and therefore, uh, antibiotics are taken even when there's a viral infection, okay. very, very often. Okay, I'm going to address the first part, and then I'm going to turn to. Uh, so we all have different backgrounds here. So the people at the at the ends of the table are the only people you should rely on for clinical advice. The two of us, uh, you know, don't have a medical degree, so <laughs> but she can do the virus one. Um, so here's the lay understanding of this, which is, you know. We live in a world of bacteria. We think that bacteria live in us. But that's not really true. I think as that video showed, there are 10 times the number of bacterial cells in our body. There are 10 times the number of bacteria in our body as there are human cells. So we are actually more bacteria than we are human cells. Now, those bacteria are not just contained within us. We are sharing that bacteria all the time. They're on the surface, they're in the air, and so we live in the world of bacteria rather than bacteria living in our world. And they were there well before us, and they will be there well after us as well. Every time we use antibiotics, and remember, we use antibiotics for ourselves as patients, but something that you might not all know is that globally about 60% of antibiotics are used in animals, not necessarily just to treat sick animals, but also to make them fatter faster. So poultry get antibiotics. So, uh, you know, if you're, you know, uh, whoever the chicken supplier is, Venkis or whoever, they use massive amounts of antibiotics. So every time antibiotics are used, they are killing off the sensitive bacteria, the ones that are able to 
uh, be killed off by the, the antibiotics, the only ones that survive are the resistant ones, right? So you can think of it as, you know, mosquitoes have also evolved. The things that have, if you're a slow mosquito, you have no chance in Hyderabad because someone will swat you. So what you are saying is that some bacteria develop resistance to the drugs that are given to them. And then over time, and they, they multiply and take over. Yeah, exactly. I, think, I think that's important for that uh, understanding to get in. Correct. Yeah. So that's how resistance develops. It's an environmental phenomenon. So you have resistance in, in the soil, you have it, uh, you know, you have it in the environment and you certainly have it within us where it causes infections. So that's, that's why this is a global problem. Now when we had a first case of something called New Delhi metallobeta-lactamase, one particular resistant pathogen in a patient from New Delhi, that then quickly spread to 100 countries within just five years. So actions by one community, one country can have global consequences. So this is a lot like climate change. What we do here has consequences for everyone else. That's a very brief sort of introduction there. Uh, I'm going to turn to Radha and then to Alison. So Radha, uh, yeah. Why, why, why uh, so bacteria and viruses are very different organisms and they cause infection by entirely different means. So bacteria are free living forms. Most infections are actually you know, caused by bacteria that don't get inside cells. There are infections also caused by intracellular bacteria, but most of the time the bacteria are free living forms. So they can grow, they have all the machinery it takes to divide and to, you know, to spread and so on and they cause infections. Viruses also cause infections, but they're actually much simpler organisms than bacteria. And they rely on getting inside another living cell to really replicate themselves and then to spread and, and move on. The types of drugs that kill bacteria don't kill viruses. And the types of drugs that kill viruses don't kill bacteria because their genomes are completely different. And what you're targeting, what you're trying to do inside the bacteria with the drug, you know, those proteins don't exist in the viruses so they can't have any overlapping effects so when you have a bacterial infection you're treated with an antibiotic but if it's a viral infection then you shouldn't be so that takes us to the question why is it that there's so much abuse now one of the problems in India is that we have a very high burden of disease we have a, the highest burden of bacterial infections and so it's not uh, it's, 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 it's perhaps uh, practical for a physician to assume that perhaps you have a bacterial infection and if you're you know the patient is elderly and so on but the question really is can we distinguish have we reached that stage now where we really need to have a tool to distinguish between bacterial and viral infections and then uh, rationalize the use of antibiotics uh, and that's something that has not been that's not been the practice in the clinic when you go you show up you get a prescription of antibiotics it's empirical dosing it's not based on some test but perhaps we've reached that stage now where we actually need some sort of a gatekeeper you know some sort of a test which says yes you should really take the antibiotic or you shouldn't is there a test there are tests but they are slow uh, they take a long time if you talk about the kind of test that exists very broadly there are tests in which you uh, take you know specimen or sample from the patient and grow it up in culture that can take between 24 and 48 hours and so by the time the result is back with the physician it may be that this patient is so sick that you know it, it, it would have been worthwhile to start uh, the uh, patient 24 hours sooner so uh, the, the most widely practiced test at least in India is a, is a culture based test which takes too long but, there, but the world has moved on and um, molecular tests are being used in other parts of the world but, and, and I think the clinicians here should comment, um, for us as researchers, they make a lot of sense. Uh, how widely they're accepted in clinical practice is a, is a different issue. So we'd love to get more questions, but actually I would like to turn to you for a very specific question, which is, see, the thing about antibiotic resistance is that if you abuse an antibiotic, then the people around you are also affected because the antibiotics don't work as well. But I'd like Alison to explain that, but also explain to you as a clinician why when you take an antibiotic, the antibiotics won't work for you either in the future and also side effects. So that's a really important point. So as a prescriber, so if I see a patient on intensive care or whatever, I want to give them 
all the antibiotics under the sun. I want to give them the broadest type of antibiotic to cover absolutely everything, particularly when I don't know what type of bacteria or its resistance pattern. And I do that to feel safe and that I'm giving them everything. However, I'm, if I do that, I'm not thinking very carefully about what happens when they get infection in a week or what happens if they stay in that ICU and I've used up the antibiotics on them that will cause resistance so I can't use it again. So by only thinking of the patient in front of me at that particular moment, I'm not thinking about their future and I'm not thinking about the future of the patients around them, their family and the externality, the issues for society. And also that's one of the, that's one of the difficulties in terms of changing doctors' behaviors because we as doctors want to deal with you as an individual sometimes it's hard for us to think of you in a little bit in the future, not months, but even weeks or even, few d even days sometimes, depending on how critically ill or the environment you're, you're in. And the other thing is you're so thinking about the individual that you fail to see the impact of using antibiotics on neighboring patients, the public and society. So it's a it's a hard message for prescribers as well as society. And in terms of using the right language, I think we've had a big problem that the communication has been so lousy. And indeed, the welcome were changing the terms from antibiotic resistance, which is too, sometimes too difficult to think about, to drug-resistant infection, um, just to make the message a little bit clearer. Yeah, hello. Hi. Um, so basically, I wanted to ask, uh, if developing new antibiotics is going to be useful at all because eventually the anti uh, bacteria uh, or any microorganism, fungi or whatever, is going to become resistant to those as well. So shouldn't we be looking at the, uh, or other ways to counter these, like for instance the bacteriophage th uh, therapy for against bacteria. The bacteriophages are basically viruses that infect bacteria and kill them. So shouldn't we be looking at uh, such uh, suitable theories and uh, how are we doing uh, in India with respect to uh, fundamental research when it comes to antibiotic resistance and uh, uh, related areas? That, And also I just wanted to make a note that not as, as a cell biologist I feel compelled to say that not all viruses are bad, like how not all bacteria are bad. Because some viruses infect only plants, some viruses only infect let's say elephants, they don't infect humans. So I just wanted to make that note. <laughs> Because we are making the viruses the bad people here. We have to stand up for the good viruses, <laughs> that's true. Okay, Radha. Um, so to your question of do we really need to find new antibiotics, I think the... Pr <laughs> we might. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think the, um, the, the problem of drug resistance um, is multifaceted and the solutions also have to be equally multifaceted. So while we have to look at prevention of resistance by improving health, uh, by improving sanitation, hygiene, uh, looking at practices in, uh, in, in, uh, po uh, you know, in the veterinary space as well as looking at how uh, we dump antibiotics, uh, you know, pharma manufacturers and so on and so forth, while we have to look at all of those things, um, there is always going to be a situation where you'll need drugs. Um, I think that to not put effort and not put any uh, uh, serious consideration uh, resources into that kind of an effort, uh, that's going to be very perilous. So if you look at multi-drug resistant infections today, pan-drug resistant infections, they are resistant. So the New Delhi metallo uh, beta lactamase containing bacteria, these are resistant to what we call last line antibiotics, the carbapenems. There's nothing else beyond that except for colistin and the use of colistin is fraught with all kinds of uh, problems, you know, nephrotoxicity uh, and so on. So a lot of patients can't tolerate it. So what are you going to say to patients when they have really tough infections and you have to say, sorry, we can't do anything. So I, I don't think that's a great situation. So modern science has to continue to progress and look for new compounds at the same time realizing that uh, resistance to that compound is also going to evolve, uh, emerge at some point, and so it has to be used carefully. In fact, it's exactly this conundrum that has uh, been uh, the uh, the most difficult aspect from a drug developer point of view um, for new antibiotics. So let me 
just explain that point a bit. It takes 23 years to break even from selling antibiotics. Just think about that for a minute. It, it, it's a very long time. As a company, can you survive that long? Can you, can you make this a sustainable process? No. And the reason why it takes this long is because antibiotics are priced cheap, even though they're consumed widely. They're not, they're not priced like cancer drugs. They're not priced like most other drugs. And so there is a very difficult, it's a very difficult proposition to be discovering new antibiotics. So I always say this, it's difficult to find, it's difficult, it's difficult to identify, and it's difficult to develop. So use them carefully. But once we take a drug to the market, we have to tell physicians, please use this sparingly. No, and this is a very, uh, you know, so it's like, just think about any consumer product. You take it to the market and you say, please don't use this. So we'll get to the bacteriophage later offline because, uh, you know, that's, that's the special. Here, question at the back. This one? Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, few, few important steps that NHS has taken, which is giving us some uh, good news in the era of uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. Uh, can you just tell us, I know it's a, a too big a subject to uh, talk, but at least few important highlights that has made this difference. Certainly. So um, Ramanan was alluding to um, a major success story in the UK, well, in, in terms of reducing the MRSA, which is a uh, resistant Staph aureus, a very common um, organism. And in the UK, we were seeing far too many of those as bloodstream infections in, um, in our hospitals. And it became a political target. So the number each hospital was given a target and they had to reach that target every year and there were teams going into the hospitals if the numbers weren't right and a huge amount of work was done in it and it had huge amounts of external attention and as I say it was a it was a political political goal um, what's really important is that one mustn't lose sight of other organisms when you look at only one because to look at only one is never good enough um, but it was a major success story and a huge amount of investment in terms of time and, and, and promotion of very good practice in hospitals in terms of infection control and some around antibiotic resistance. But now the, it's being swung much more to all the work around um, preserving antibiotics in hospital. And this again is something that is going to be mandated for all hospitals that have to me measure their quantities of antibiotics particularly a drug that we've just heard about from Rada, carbapenems, and we're going to have to look at reducing those in hospitals. So the success story was around uh, MRSA, this particular bacteria that was causing bloodstream infections, a, a resistant one, although not nearly as resistant as the things we're talking about now. Um, and, and there's now the political will and a real, um, a real movement around looking at the antibiotic prescribing in hospital. And we have a chief medical officer who is highly, highly active about this and says, of course, it's not just an issue for hospitals and healthcare, it's an issue for biosecurity and it's not just an issue for one country, it's something that we all need to work on together. So that chief medical officer is actually in Hyderabad today and she's speaking at the meeting day after tomorrow, uh, Sally Davies, so she's very passionate about this. But just one thing to add to what uh, both my co-panelists said. You know, this particular class of bacteria that we are up against mostly in India are called gram-negatives. Now, it just means that it has a different cell wall that is actually more difficult to make a drug for. So this MRSA problem in comparison was easier. They came up with new drugs. The kind of stuff that Radha is working on, much more difficult to come up with a drug for. And in fact, this carbapenem resistance is a serious issue because, let me re-emphasize, if you get these carbapenem resistant infections and you know I have we have clinicians in the audience from you know from various hospitals there is really nothing that the doctor can do for you so when you hear of someone having died of multi organ failure that's typically what's going on that you know essentially everything broke down and uh, you know it, there was nothing more that could be done for the patient so you know no one says they I died of a drug well they don't say it but no one says you know so and so died of a drug resistant infection you say they died of multi organ failure and that's usually what what that's uh, uh, you know that's characterizing so uh, yeah can we have the question at the back yeah uh, in fact right now only portion of all that you have said has sunk in and it's already frightening. 
I have two questions. One is, how do any of us become a smarter patient or a caregiver for a patient? So what are the right kind of minimal questions we can pose to the doctor who is taking care without putting him or her off, at the same time making sure we are on the right track? That's one. And the second one is, do you think it's time that we went back to our grandma's remedies of for when you have throat pain, going for uh, warm milk with haldi in it, you know, and allowing the fever to take its own course, five days, seven days. Do you think it's time that we all became a little more alert to those kinds of uh, things and then take extra care? Thank you. <coughs> very, very good question. I think it is, that is how this uh, whole, and I congratulate Manthan for organizing this. I think the pub, uh, the public engagement is going to be uh, extraordinarily helpful in uh, getting the infection or the healthcare associated infection lower. I think as a patient, you need to ask questions to the doctor definitely because you need to be an informed decision maker. So when he comes and examines you, you need to ask him whether he has washed his hands because our hands is full of organisms. and. Uh, what we do when they wash is only reduce the burden of the organisms within the hand and that, that needs to be done. When they don't wash hands and they see you and then they go and see another patient and the third patient they are transmitting bugs. Most of it it doesn't happen and you, you come out hale and hearty because these bugs are good bugs. But moment a difficult like what has been mentioned, a pan drug resistant bugs comes and it gets transferred, then the disaster happens. Second is when they are admitted in the hospital or you go in, go as a bystander, you see the doctors railing with the bed rails, the high surfaces, he uses mobile phones, he uses white coat which is not washed, he enters into a, a, a room where he is not worn a pub, uh, a protective elements uh, like mask and gowns and you need to ask those questions to him because you need to be a very informed um, bystander or a patient so, and challenge him because he needs to pr uh, follow these good practices. He has not washed hands and he has transmitted that's why more antibiotic has been given. So that is what Alison has been mentioning a good infection control practices goes hand in hand with good antimicrobial prescription. Second, what you said is absolutely true. Those homemade remedies definitely are, uh, I think, uh, they, are, they are going to be there for uh, years and years together. And those anti-infective properties of those haldi and uh, jeera, pani and all of this have been proven and they have been quite effective. Third thing which I wanted to mention, like uh, my father-in-law, I, I hope you don't know him and uh, you are not going to mention when you meet him. If he has a loose motion, prompt he takes a Dependal M. And when you ask how is your loose motion, it's better. So what's happened to that tablet, I have stopped it. And that's the practice. So why resistance is happening? Because we don't give proper drug, one. We also don't give proper duration. Because if we see a result, we stop it. And that's how the resistance happens. We don't adequately give, adequate frequency is not given. So doctors and the patient love the word 5 days, 10 days and 14 days. And there is no science behind this. But it is given like that. And that's I think uh, a call for action from the community. I'd like to add a corollary to what Pavati asked and she probably asked that but it, uh, de uh, it deserves an answer. What kind of questions do I ask a doctor when he is planning to prescribe antibiotics? And that is probably what he wanted to know. Right? If you are going to prescribe antibiotics to me, how do I make sure that you are right? <laughs> That's a difficult question. But we keep saying in our hospital, uh, there is a hierarchy which exists in the hospital. There are cardiovascular thoracic surgeons, there is cardiologist, there is God. And then there are physicians and the surgeons. <laughs> so if you are meeting a pediatrician, you can ask any question. People like me will 
help you. If you are meeting a cardiologist and a cardiovascular floor above God, don't ask them. You need to ask them with your lead jackets on, your helmets on, because they are untouchables. You just cannot ask any questions. We don't ask them as an administrator or as a physician. So forget about a patient asking them. But I think that is important because that, that's what Alison was referring to and that's what Ramanan also said. The problem in West had been gram positive and which was possibly easier to tackle. The problem in our country had been gram negative bugs which are difficult and there are multiple of them which are developing resistance. So I don't know whether it is very easy to ask but if you I think infection control practices would be easier to ask the doctor, have you followed these instructions? But it would be absolutely good to ask why he has given, what he has given, what he thought would be a possible organism. At least that is a very courteous way to ask him what he thought was an organism for what he has been covering. Because as Alison says, the doctor's tendency is to cover broad and that there he is parting to resistance pattern because he doesn't want the patients to lose or he wants the patient to have an early impact so he gives the broadest spectrum and that's where uh, he starts uh, losing the case. <laughs> so can we, can we have the question at the back and then we'll come back to you. So we'll, can you put it? He's been waiting to ask for quite some time. Uh, I want to ask this question considering therapeutic failure. Uh, we have been looking at therapeutic failure on the aspect of bacterial resistance to antibiotics. Now, what is the role of the host factor in, in therapeutic failure, considering the fact that the drugs can also interact with the host and also the immune status? If we look at pediatric, there are low immune status. Do we necessarily give drugs at any time? And also control the adverse reaction. Doing this, will that not be an avenue for resistance to build up among these patients? So I'm not going to do your question complete justice, but I, I think what you've said is, a, is really important that we raise this issue about the uh, immune system. And I think one of the things that we've not talked about enough tonight is actually the role of vaccines and how critical it is if we vaccinate and use vaccines more and, and develop immunity to infections, that we're relying on immunity then rather than unnecessary use of antibiotics. So I think the issue about the immune system is really, really important. And then the other point you were talking about, neonates. So we understand, so both neonates and the elderly um, are, are not as strong immunologically. So that's something we recognize and why they're a little bit, why they're more at risk. And there are other approaches to treating infections that are using the immune system rather than um, antibiotics, of course, but I'm not gonna expand on that just now. But the issue about immunity and using that is really, really important. You wanted to disagree with Dr. Sanjeev Singh. Yeah. Uh, I want to narrate an incident that happened to me very recently. Uh, I'm a clinician. I'm a cardiologist by training. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I took my six... No, no, no. They, I, I want to ask some questions about antibiotic uh, resistance also in this. Uh, I took my six-week-old... Uh, baby girl to a reputed renowned uh, children's hospital in Hyderabad for vaccination. The pediatrician there, even before examining her chest, says that she has a respiratory infection. And uh, she, uh, he, he asked me to take, I, I, I never tell that I'm a doctor when I take my family members to a hospital. Uh, so he doesn't know that I'm a doctor. And uh, he suggested that I admit my six-week-old daughter in the ER and he started prescribing intravenous antibiotics. So when I asked him why did he examine the chest, this is a real incident. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not... not uh, uh, they were just conducted sounds. 
I told him that I'm, I'm a doctor. He was taken a little aback, but he was so arrogant and he was saying that I'm a pediatrician, you are a cardiologist. <laughs> I, you know only about heart, I know about your entire child. So that was his answer. But what, what I want to ask about antimicrobial resistance here is, uh, I'm not quoting from literature, but from my personal experiences and observations. Uh, how and who are going to change the prescribing practices of uh, doctors? Whose responsibility is it? Uh, because uh, uh, leave alone the qualified, educate, uh, trained doctors. You, you, there are a lot of uh, quacks out there who prescribe antibiotics very rampantly. So who are going to control that? And the second thing is uh, antibiotics are available in any pharmacy. You can go to the biggest pharmacy and any pharmacy, anybody can buy any antibiotic. So who are going to control that? Whose responsibility is that? And how we are going to control that? And as a patient, most of the patients who have to attend their jobs on a daily basis, they have to go back to their work. They have to end their daily wage. And their concern there is, I want my pain to reduce or I want my problem to reduce. They, they, are, they don't bother about the cause of the disease or etiology of the disease. So how are we going to educate them about uh, this thing? Thanks. You know, the first question, I don't know if you've all heard this joke. You know, if you go to a party, how do you find out which one the cardiologist is? Does anyone know? No, don't worry, he'll tell you. So <laughs> but what our cardiologist friend has just said, that that's probably not the cardiologist, that's the pediatrician who should be the, 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 the subject of that joke. But I'm going to turn to Alison to actually uh, provide an answer on this other point, which is a very good point. And really, this is the major conundrum of antibiotics, right? So how do we actually control it? We have in India this H1 schedule, which you're supposed to record the antibiotic in a in a register at uh, you know at the pharmacy when you go in there it is completely flouted but it is not that we cannot follow this rule you cannot get an opioid in a pharmacy you know just without a prescription and uh, you know just over the counter like that so we are capable of following rules in this country when it's really important the question is really around why we don't consider this important enough to follow that rule so but I'm sure you know that there are other experiences to learn from as well. So I can answer in a very limited way, not how you can take on all of the medical establishment and, and get them to toe the line, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples from my own practice and from the um, UK. And I might ask my colleague over there, Esmita, about something that they do about delayed prescriptions delayed prescribing in, in, um, in community and primary care. So we we are now really looking at individual leaders and we realize it's the clinical leaders that are critically important in changing the practice of the junior arrogant doctors coming through so we need to deal with that arrogance work with them it needs to be part of their training and even when you're a senior consultant that your practice needs to be reviewed and actually the chief executive of your hospital and your medical director should be looking at your performance in terms of how well you prescribe antibiotics so we, that's part of the practice, but we need the clinical, we really need the clinical leaders. We have a program called Start Smart Then Focus, which is about in hospitals, but I wonder if I could just talk about what we do in the community about using delayed prescriptions. Um, just for a second. Thank you. Um, so in the UK, in the community, um, one way we've tried to challenge um, the overuse of antibiotics, overprescribing of antibiotics, specifically for children, pushy parents to go and want antibiotics for their children, is that um, it's the psychology of that transaction, that the, the, the patient wants to walk away with a prescription, with a slip. So what we say, the delayed prescription is, you can have the prescription, but wait for 48, 24 to 48 hours. If your symptoms don't improve, then go and cash in that prescription and get the antibiotics. That's one approach. The other approach we have is we give, um, instead of giving a prescription, we actually give a, a piece of uh, leaflet that looks exactly like a prescription, but it tells them why they probably don't have a bacterial infection and why they probably don't need an antibiotic to treat their symptoms. That's just an example in the UK. But in Thailand as well, there's been a really good paper about, um, you know, it, you work with whatever the culture is locally and what people accept. So in Thailand, 
they're really into homeopathic medicines and alternative medicines uh, and natural remedies. So what the GPs were, uh, or community doctors were, were um, encouraged to do is to give a um, alternative natural remedy for colds and flu that has some scientific um, evidence that it works instead of antibiotics and people buy that and they were happy to walk away with that. Right, so... Um <coughs> and then tomorrow to you. This is uh, Dr. Alison. Are the hospital acquired infections in NHS made uh, available in the public domain for people to understand which hospital has got higher amount of hospital acquired infection or yeah. something like that? Okay, so mine is linked to diagnostics. So um, as some of the panel might know, I'm running a global competition which is looking for a very quick diagnostic that will be able to tell a doctor or a patient whether they have a viral infection or a bacterial infection. And the question to the panel uh, that for India is, if this kind of diagnostic existed, what difference do you think it would make in hospitals, in pharmacies, in community health in India? and also for patients themselves making their own decisions about how to medicate. So in, in answer to the first question, all the data is publicly available. So the data, the data is publicly available. All Sorry. So in answer, in answer to the question about is the data available, yes. Uh, the data, but this is the data on what is measured so I think what we need to encourage is measuring more and sharing more. But what is measured is out there. So it was mandatorily reported and publicly available. And the issue about diagnostics, I'll, I'll hand over, but diagnostics absolutely critical, and not just for the beginning of treatment, but how we monitor and change therapy. So a quick response from Sanjeev on the diagnostic. Before that, uh, even uh, Indian data is available. There are 353 hospitals who are accredited by NABH and all of them they mandatorily report hospital acquired uh, healthcare associated infections. Unfortunately, the maturity to deal with uh, this data with the media or with the public is, uh, is very little. That's why the report is only given to the respective institutions. But there is in even India data available. With respect to the diagnostic, as soon as the rapid diagnostic come in, as uh, what um, Radha was mentioning, we have to wait for 48 hours and then if it is non-fermenters, then you need to spe have sp uh, the specificities and then you again wait for 72 uh, to uh, 96 hours. If it is all, the rapid diagnostics are now available, which is five, uh, five hours, it will really change the scenario of empirically treat. And that's where we, we tell doctors to as what Alison was telling, start smart and then focus. So everybody is starting whatever they want to start, but they don't de-escalate when the report even comes because they want they don't want to take that risk. And if it is a rapid diagnostic, that starting will become extremely smart. So you are very very focused, and then de-escalation if there is a behavioral change which doesn't happen, uh, then the harm to the patient will not. Happen. So it is going to be revolutionary. Just to explain what uh, what Sanjeev meant by de-escalation is you get put on an antibiotic when you enter the hospital because the doctor has no idea what is going on with you. That is the truth of it. They give you an antibiotic and then they say we'll wait for the test result to come back. Correctly what they should do is that if the test result came back negative, they should take you off the antibiotic which is what de-escalation is. We did a study in the US recently of the six of the best facilities in the US and in half the cases when the test result was negative they did not change the antibiotics. So I doubt that the situation is very different for us here in India. It's the same way because, you know, one doctor may have put the person in the antibiotic, another person doesn't want to take them off the antibiotic. A lot of it becomes very, you know, human, human interaction things. But on the diagnostics, Jamal, let me say that particularly for India, when we have antibiotics that cost between 10 and 50 rupees, there is very little chance that someone is going to go pay for a diagnostic which costs 500 rupees to figure out whether to take a 50 rupee antibiotic. They'll just take the 50 rupee antibiotic. So unless the price that you're running and the result comes out with a 20 rupee diagnostic, it is not going to change the prescription for a 50 rupee uh, antibiotic. So the price point is really, really critical here, and particularly 
because much of our population, you know, these are the price points on which they work. So I think, uh, yeah, um, yeah, sure. But I, I think we can distinguish between uh, the uh, antibiotics that are used in the hospitals. You know, on the in the hierarchy of things, the simple penicillins, etc., may not need uh, to be you know used along with a diagnostic. But when you're looking at carbapenem use, for example, I think uh, at that point you're looking at a different price point for the drug itself, and it could be combined with the companion diagnostic, and therefore the use of that drug would become more rational. In fact, this is one of the ways in which we believe that future drug development has to happen. And so our drugs are uh, being developed along with a companion diagnostic so we can identify whether a particular patient should be taking that antibiotic or not. So it's built into the way we, we think that uh, antibiotics will be used in the future. Good evening. My name is Dr. Mahesh Joshi. I have a quick couple of points, and uh, if, if that's okay, Ajay, we can just make. So I was just looking at, you know, making it more relevant from an Indian perspective on the Indian scenario and what are the challenges as far as the resistance piece is concerned. So I look at there are six pieces come to mind. The first one is the public. You know, from the public perspective, what we can do in terms of the antibiotic resistance scenario, which is one obviously is we are all very Google savvy, go with all kinds of questions over days, but that may not be the most appropriate thing to get response from the doctor. I think the battery in this is gone, the cordless. It's, uh, uh, it's going back and forth, so I think the battery is weak in this. We can hear. Yeah. So, one is that this. From a common man's perspective, I look at, I think the first take away, simplest from a physician's perspective that I can tell all of you is every fever, the first response need not be an antibiotic. I think that's a simple takeaway. Just because you have a fever, you need not ask for an antibiotic, you need not be started on antibiotic, it needs to be just, however, there are two caveats that we must remember and this is not for clinicians but from a layman's perspective, extremes of ages a neonatal and the elderly people, you've got to be cautious because if you lose time in these extremes of ages, sometimes it can be life-threatening. So while it is good to not take antibiotics in extreme of ages, you've got to be very cautious because you don't get the conventional signs of worsening that you would see otherwise in a young or a healthy guy. The second thing is in terms of the policy, I think just like the antibiotics have uh, over time evolve into microbial resistance. Our politicians also have a, a willful resistance to what is needed in the country. So um, I think the public has to put pressure. Health, it is good that at least in this budget we saw something coming relevant towards the health care. It's a good step. But I think unless people ask for things, things will not change. You have to question, you have to bring issues like this from platforms like Manthan who are actually taking this up, although it's a clinical topic, but they have taken to ask questions. The third and most important, I think Abhijit pointed out and uh, the other doctor is the practitioners. You know, we have this whole shortage of doctors, therefore we have looked at the alternative streams like Ayush and we have recognized them to practice allopathy and they have no formal training actually on pharmacopoeia or the medications, etc. So in a way we are actually tempting them to prescribe. The next P is pharmaceutical industry and physician nexus. Actually, a lot of this is driven by the incentive um, that drives a physician to prescribe that particular medicine. Luckily, in the last couple of years, the Medical Council and also the government regulations have plugged a little bit of this, but I think um, a lot of this still does not apply to the uh, not very prominent doctors, not very prominent institutions, uh, not uh, very high practice doctors, etc. The next one is from a patient's perspective, if I look at the next piece from a patient's point of view, I think uh, it's very, very important that when you go across to any institution, instead of focusing on the drug part, look at the hygiene, basic hygiene around that institution and that's where your focus should be. When you look at a hospital, look at cleanliness, look at simple basic things, do they have anything to talk about 
hand washing etc that is available into the hospital premises instead of fancy ambulances or fancy uh, computers etc being put up small things like hand washing a sterilium or something which is there to wash their hands the dr allison pointed out the next piece prevention we have been taught right since childhood prevention is the key i think if we work more on prevention and adult vaccination is a neglected area in this country and if we focus on to this part better i think that something will help us to tackle in a better manner this whole epidemic of antibiotic resistance so i think these are uh, some important points that i thought i'll highlight thank, thank you thank you those are very helpful very nice. so uh, i'm going to have uh, maybe we can take you know five or six more questions and uh, so if we can have shahid and couple of questions out of front oh there's someone else here okay 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 uh, <laughs> i just want to ask some molecular mechanism about the resistance so if you look at the antibiotic resistance the resistance genes are actually the actually produced by the bacteria that produces the antibiotic itself so if you use the antibiotics more then the resistance will somehow come out it is there in in the soil bacterium every if even if you take out the soil bacterium it will be resistant to 7 to 8 anti um, antibiotics so why not you uh, why don't you focus on developing substances that will act against the resistance mechanism let's say the beta lactamase can you develop a some molecule against the beta lactamase so yes in fact that is uh, one of the ways in which um, new antibiotics are being developed so for example augmentin is an example of that it's amoxicillin plus clavulanate and clavulanate essentially inactivates the simple beta lactamase uh, that some of the gram negative bacteria make and if you look at the more recent drug approvals they are essentially carbapenem like meropenem or imipenem combined with a beta lactamase and those beta lactamases uh, those beta lactamase inhibitors work against specific beta lactamases the problem with this approach is that if you have a different kind of beta lactamase in that bacteria that combination won't work so here is an example where if you want to treat a patient with that combination of a beta lactam plus an inhibitor to the resistance mechanism you got to know very clearly what the resistance mechanism is uh, and that approach is now you know being uh, widely pursued uh, but let me tell you that when you look at the metallo beta lactamases these are the most deadly uh, beta lactamases out there and they inactivate the carbapenems Uh, so the ndm1 type enzymes we don't have anything right now so uh, raman and i wanted to turn the discussion to something that we haven't discussed so far and that is the contamination of the environment with antibiotics um, i saw a report recently on youtube i don't know when it was made but it's a, it's a report from hyderabad a local tv station did this report uh, where they looked at the effluent water from uh, one of the dr bulk drug manufacturers which are um, and there are plenty of those in hyderabad uh and you know these this this effluent water although it was being treated according to the government standards was loaded with antibiotics uh and the uh, you know the the office was in charge of uh, the the effluent treatment <coughs> he said that you know we are doing everything according to the book it's just that there are no standards it's just that there are no standards in our treatment manuals to even look for antibiotics and that is really scary so uh, i mean we need to really talk about public policy along these lines that i mean we keep talking about hospitals but here is something in the environment the environment is being contaminated by people who are making these antibiotics how many of you have seen this video it's by vice news have you seen it some it's floating around on facebook and all of that if you haven't seen it i'm happy to to send a copy of this it's a it was made by this vice tv channel it was made in hyderabad actually just came out recently in fact you know a few weeks ago um you know i was hoping not to completely depress the audience today and already you know people have started leaving because now it's getting more and more hopeless you have the doctors not doing the right thing you have the hospitals not engaging in infection control and once you get to effluent and all of that then you know i think people have to throw up their hands so i think that's the reason we didn't really get into it but i think 
the point that you're making is a really, really good one. We are engaged in this large-scale human experiment, or experiment on ourselves uh, at an ecological scale. And the only other case we're doing that experiment of at that scale is with climate change. So, which is why you know, if one doesn't do us, then the other one will. Uh, I don't know if any of the panelists wants to respond to that uh, that concern or acknowledge it. Rather, do you want to say anything? Okay. I think that problem can be fixed. It's not as difficult to fix as some of the other things we're talking about, such as emergence of resistance and so on. It's actually something that, uh, it, should the drug manufacturers really put their mind to, it, it can be done. And it's been done elsewhere, so why not? No, but they can be voluntarily adopted, considering that the effect on the environment is, is, is clear. I think that you know, the only thing stopping us is our own conscience and ethics. Yeah, I mean, that is true, but I think that's where we all have to be more informed consumers. And we have, there is, you know, in fact, there is no advocacy group right. for anyone for, who is dealing with antimicrobial resistance. Uh, there is no, as soon as you get better from an infection, you walk away from it, you don't think about becoming a member of some, you know, anti, the antimicrobial resistance, uh, you know, forum. But why not? And this is how public pressure will, public pressure will build and something will change in this country. Yeah. It's up to you. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. We might lose a... Uh, uh, thank Go you ahead. for the discussion. I'm going to remove my physician hat and the antimicrobial. Is anyone here not talking? <laughs> but okay, <laughs> actually, just wear my citizen hat, if you will. Um, I think as uh, every big problem we faced, when it's come to this critical time, we've really responded in good ways. I think the biggest step is that we understand that it is that critical at this moment, and just as uh, bacteria are as resilient as they are people are as resilient too. I think recognition and knowledge of what's going on is the biggest step. Human behavior is going to be the toughest thing to change along this. Uh, regulation can come in, um, the changes and the drugs and the medications will come in as difficult as they are and the pipeline is dry. But I think human behavior is going to be our difficult thing. Going to be how is that clinician going to be comfortable? How is that patient going to be comfortable? making that change and recognizing this is as difficult as it is and for individuals it's harder to deal with it's a society problem and it might be that when we explain it in an individual level it's helpful too that each antibiotic you take we're finding more and more that it puts you at, at a bigger risk of other things um, bringing it down to an n of one um, but that's where i think you know talking about all the depressive things that they are I think there's enough po positive light. Each country that has dealt with it, when they've recognized that it is critical, have come on top with it. Australia have responded after they were one of the worst hit with it. Other countries have responded. I think it's our time to make it known. I think this next three days out here, and that's why I think is a huge clinician turnout here, um, is going to be critical to make that message and make it in a more non-scientific way, but really saying, this is the simplest message we have and that we recognize it and we respond to it. And we've seen that the response can be just as hard when we recognize that the message is really critical. Well, well said, very well said. I think that's excellent. So we'll turn to another clinician. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Sunita Naredi, Naredi, infectious disease consultant here at Apollo. Uh, I'm going to say something radical and I hope people don't start throwing stones at me here. Um, I'm going to take an analogy of how... Think about pediatricians. <laughs> and I Not about pediatricians. <laughs> if you take the analogy of how we have free uh, education, free college education, uh, particularly for professional courses, there's a lot of criticism that goes off that we're producing tons of engineers, but not necessarily good quality engineers. Now, everything that we provide at a low cost should come with the uh, with some kind of a mechanism where you monitor the output also. Okay. That does not mean just because you're getting it for cheap or free, it's better. Okay. Now, when we come in to medications, this is one field that we always try to bring down the cost. Antibiotics are life-saving, agreed. 
but when we're trying to bring down the cost, are we also compromising on the quality? There are a lot of companies that keep providing medications. If you're talking about carbapenems, we've been talking about it all day. There are, what, 100 companies that make carbapenems? Their price range could be as varied as 250 rupees per while to uh, 7,000 rupees a while. It's huge price range difference. Now, how are you getting good quality for a low cost? I have no idea. Is it really what you... Are you paying what you get for? Is it what ex exactly you get when you take the medicines? We don't have good quality controls. So if you don't have a good quality, you are going to breed drug resistance. So that's something people who need it can get it. Should everybody get it for a lower cost? Then if you may restrict just by increasing the cost of certain drugs. Whereas today, I can get carbapenem very easily. But, but if I need ampicillin or cefazolin, I really have to search for it. Penicillin, I really have to search for it. I can't find it. Why? Because there's no profit in the um, drug, and the drug companies don't want to make it. Drug, ceiling, uh, drug price ceiling is good, but at some point you have to also look at what is good in the big context, in the big picture, what is the collateral damage. You know, that's a very, very, very important question. I don't think anyone will throw stones at all, and I think we need to take on those kinds of questions. So just so everyone knows, penicillin, ampicillin, you know, it costs maybe two rupees. But because it's two rupees, no one really wants to make it, whereas this carbapenems, they can sell for more money. And the pharmacy is making money off of pushing the carbapenem out there as well. So I think the question you're raising is an extremely good one. I don't think any country really has an answer to that particular question. Uh, what's the appropriate price of antibiotics? Uh, is it, it's a problem if they are too expensive, but it's also a problem if they are too cheap, because then we don't respect them for being the very powerful life-saving drugs that they are. So um, uh, maybe we'll take three more questions, because Radha has to leave at around eight. So uh, if we can just... So Gina's out there. We have a question at the back over there. So if you want to ask a question at all, please raise your hand, and then we'll just cover everyone who's there. Four, I guess, over there. Yeah, yeah. I have a quick question, and uh, it's open for any panelists uh, here. What's the role of the reduction, reductionist approach, the non-holistic approach of the, which is typical of uh, modern Medicare, uh, in escalating this problem? Uh, I hope you got this uh, question. So, and the second quick question is, uh, what are the natural probiotic uh, uh, foods that we can take. So the ho holistic bit, I think um, it, it uh, both from the modern medicine as well as the alternate system medicine, there are good uh, combination which is available, but there needs to be a trust factor between modern medicine practice and Indian system of medicine practice. There are, both the systems have uh, adequate uh, molecules which possibly have anti-infective properties which needs to be used well. Probiotics, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not here to market uh, the, the nutraceutical part of it, but it is extremely helpful and I think that should be, as a nutritional supplement, that should be part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the daily diet process. Um, I have uh, two questions. Uh, they're a little different, but uh, the first one is that isn't it? Would it be easier to curb the use of antibiotics if you didn't give it so easily over the counter, like it is in the rest of the world? Um, because you get it so easily, it's used more, it's abused more. Um, that's one question. And the second one is is that when you have kids, um, how long do you wait to start on antibiotics? I have a very good pediatrician, and she usually says three to five days. But sometimes within five days, it gets really bad. So how do we as parents or even as you know, caregivers of older people gauge when you start antibiotics? So I'm going to turn to Alison for the second question and talk about perhaps what the Swedes do, because the Swedes don't give an antibiotic immediately. So I think that's a, you know, you raise a, a concern of every, um, uh, of every, cons every worried parent. However, I mean, there are significant different national um, trends and attitudes to that. So in Scandinavia, they certainly don't feel that antibiotics are the first, um, are the first and natural response to um, a, a sick child. And I think there's a real societal 
issue there as well about when you want to uh, when you want to give them. So I'm I'm not a pediatrician, but I'm a parent, and I also uh, have worried in the past uh, about that. Uh, and and I think that's that's why you need the uh, you and, and 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 there is a societal pressure uh, as well, thinking that they are the first thing to give and that they need to be given. But that's not always the case. But you do need the trust of your uh, you do need the trust of working closely with somebody who knows your, uh, who, who's aware of the illness of your child. I think the issue that Esmita raises, which is about the delayed prescription or being, uh, being able to go back. On the very first question, you know, this is a challenge for us here. The, here, you might have a doctor, you can go get a prescription and go to the pharmacy. But if you're in a remote area, you don't have access to a doctor, and we don't have enough doctors in this country, if you necessarily mandate that the doctor has to be the one that gets you an antibiotic, then it prevents access for a lot of people. So it's a problem here because we don't have enough doctors. So I think that issue is really, really important about the context that we're discussing this for different countries it has to be recognized that the context can be very, very different in terms of access to antibiotics, access to good health care, and also risk. I think we need to take all of those and recognize that the context is very different in, in very different countries, although there is an overarching goal. There was another question over there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, can we consider global epidemics like swine flu, bird flu, Ebola, Zika as superbugs? And is meat industry responsible for the drug abuse they have? And can they be held responsible for any kind of epidemic that bursts out of uh, drug abuse? Do you want to talk about it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so maybe. Uh, you know, when we talk about superbugs, typically we're talking to bugs that have become very malevolent, I mean, very vicious. Uh, because they became resistant to drugs that were used. Now, all of the examples that you cited were viral, uh, were viruses that were causing disease, and many of them uh, emerged in human populations more recently, and so we don't actually have drugs for them, and that's how they cause so much damage. So, uh, I mean, I'm not sure that we would use the nomenclature superbugs, uh, but they're terribly vicious infections. Yeah, the kind, kind request to the panelists. Um, the terminology AMR is confusing, and as a country, you know, uh, where we speak all different languages, you know, it's very difficult to translate that in a local language. So, as a result of which, a lot of us here are advocates of this information. There is more and more a need to make it, uh, you know, translatable for local audiences. Right. So that's that's a that's an important challenge, and I think, as Alison was saying, uh, the Wellcome Trust is pushing the idea of drug-resistant infections. But I, I would rather pitch it in a different way, you know, which is that this is a challenge of access to effective antibiotics. To me, the great injustice is if you've been a poor person living in rural Bihar, first time in your life you're old enough, or sorry, you're wealthy enough to be able to afford an antibiotic and that antibiotic doesn't work for you, not because you did anything wrong, but because lots of people before you abused the antibiotic, and when you finally have that antibiotic, it doesn't work for you, that is a problem of lack of access to effective antibiotics. So even if you took the whole resistant thing out of the story, I think to me this lack of access to effective antibiotics is really what we're up against today. And it's a huge equity issue there because, uh, you know, some of us who are who've been more privileged, have had the privilege of abusing antibiotics for many generations, and then there are those who have not yet had that privilege. Not of abusing them, but of using them. So I think that's where we stand. Is, is Mark Mendelssohn in the audience? Is Mark taken off? Mark. Mark, can you spend one minute talking about your, because there are so many clinicians here, about your uh, license to prescribe program at Brusco, uh Hospital. So uh, Mark's from uh, Cape Town. And they have a very interesting program in their hospital where your privileges can be taken away. So, 
Thank you. It's actually a work in progress. So it's a, it's a program that we're talking with our Health Professions Council with. Just as if you want to be a trauma surgeon or if you're a cardiologist, most trauma surgeons will have a special certificate called the um, ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. And in cardiology, you'll have advanced coronary life support. And you can't practice really within a trauma system unless you have that certification. And that generated the idea, because of the issues that we're dealing with, particularly in our hospitals, that we should think about an antibiotic prescribing license. And it's a tough challenge because it, basically what we're saying is that everybody who prescribes antibiotics should have to go through a revalidation process. We haven't uh, decided exactly whether it's going to be annual or biannual, but it would basically mean that a course, an online course in general, would have to be done. Again, this has to be adapted to different country settings. It, it's not going to be possible in that form in some. But in South Africa, what we're talking about is an online course. We've already developed the course materials, um, short, 22 short videos of anti, around antibiotic use. And, and that's what we're talking to our Health Professions Council about. Um, and we feel that, uh, as everyone feels and shares this belief, that this is a, a problem of such magnitude and with such abuse that it requires some form of validation. What happens if you don't prescribe appropriately? Well, that again, that's why you have to have checks and balances in, in place. And that's, that's a much greater issue. And that comes down to governance at specific hospitals, at specific clinics, and is a, is a long-term project. This is not a, a project that we're able to put into effect and will have results on in the, in, within a year. This is a, pro a very long-term project for the country. And as I say, it's, a, it's developing and a work in progress. In our hospitals, we have stewardship teams, we have stewardship committees, and they are responsible for, um, for overseeing prescribing habits. So, if there are no more questions, I have to say, on behalf of my panelists and myself, I have rarely, if ever, been in front of such a knowledgeable, uh, you know, maybe we didn't start from a point of being knowledgeable, but asking knowledgeable questions and such an engaging discussion on AMR, uh, on drug-resistant infections. So, uh, you know, thank you all so much for giving us the opportunity to talk about something that we, uh, we obviously care about very deeply. Uh, but hopefully you'll take forward that message and talk about this with, uh, you know, with your family and friends as well to, to really take this message home that this is a problem that affects all of us. Different countries are affected by it. It's never really on the front page of the newspaper necessarily, but, uh, you know, all of us are going to have to face upon this at some point or the other. And, uh, uh, and thanks again to uh, Welcome Trust DBT India Alliance for helping put this together, Sarah Iqbal, uh, my team from PHFI and, uh, and to Manthan as well for affording us the opportunity.